researchers coming out and asking for an immediate pause on the development of artificial intelligence beyond the capabilities of chat gpt4 now indian academics intellectuals technologists getting involved in this debate as well this make no mistake is the most important question of our times should we stop to see what's already been unleashed by artificial intelligence try and set up some guardrails or should the march of technological development on artificial intelligence continue unabashed that special focus which is a really important topic to be talking about is my top focus on the news track tonight disinformation deep fakes jobs at risk AI threat to society Global tech heads call for AI pause Indian policy makers seek critical debate real concern or fear mongering the big debate on news track at 8 pm more than 3000 global tech leaders including elon musk have called for an immediate pause on the development of artificial intelligence citing profound risks to society In India former Niti Aayog vice chairperson and other policy makers have also written an open letter to the government of India seeking a critical debate on artificial intelligence and impact on society is hitting a pause on AI for the time being a good thing or is this just fear mongering fighting disinformation and deep fakes raising concerns about regulation and threats of damaging the society the stunning rise of generative artificial intelligence has raised big red flags and so over 3000 global technology leaders and researchers including Elon Musk and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak have written an open letter warning that AI tools present profound risks to society and humanity. The letter says that AI developers are locked in an out of control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one not even their creators can understand predict or reliably control it calls for a 6 month pause on the development of systems more powerful than that of gpt4 and asks ai developers and independent experts to jointly develop and implement a set of shared safety protocols for advanced ai design and development that are rigorously audited open source means transparency because look the generative ai is getting more and more the everyday thing and then people are affected by the generative ai or using generative ai for their day to day body you want to understand what is in the model how you are training the model open source we believe is one of the most crucial answer to this question because we are ensuring the accountability transparency so if you are using like a proprietary model you never know oh how you are getting this model into the fact you know you 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 ask this model whatever questions they give you whatever answers but you may wonder why this model is giving me this answer 
unless you understand what is inside a model and how you train it, the accountability is not fulfilled. A similar call has been made in India. Former Niti Aayog vice chairman and others have written an open letter appealing to India's policymakers, academicians, thinkers, and tech experts to urgently join the critical debate on artificial intelligence and its impact on India. New technologies create opportunities which are very significant. But uh, it's time to think through it. It's time to adapt it to our needs. It's time to use it in a manner that will maximize its benefits and minimize its downside risk for our country. We have to confront this idea that AI will shape jobs, will have an impact on jobs, will have an impact on culture, will perhaps even shape the fabric of human society. So this is a discussion that cannot be postponed. And this is a discussion that must happen globally. And India must participate actively in this discussion. Is the only way to deal with the threat from AI is to shut it down? Or is it too late for that now? Bureau Report, India Today. Many of you would have seen and almost fallen for the realistic looking but fake images of Donald Trump's arrest. The Pope wearing a Balenciaga jacket. Those images were the work of AI-powered text-to-image generator Midjourney. This new AI tool is uh, being considered one of the most lethal sources of disinformation globally. For the time being, free trials have been stopped because of what the company is calling trial abuse and extraordinary demand. Once again, Midjourney's usage raises concerns about the complete lack of regulations accompanying the spectacular rise of AI. Donald Trump being dragged away by the New York police. The Pope in a white Balenciaga puffer jacket. Both sets of images revetingly realistic and startling at first sight. But if you've been even vaguely plugged into internet culture, you know that both these images are artificially created deep fakes generated by the explosively popular AI tool Midjourney. And each image made a reality with human prompts as simple as Pope in a Balenciaga puffer jacket or Trump being arrested by the NYPD. The American app has achieved sudden virality for its ability to turn fictional images into realistic photo quality pictures like the ones of Trump and Pope when provided with specific actionable prompts. So viral was the rush to sign up for free trials of Midjourney that its creators have panicked and shut down the try before you buy service. Midjourney CEO and founder David Holtz has blamed extraordinary demand and trial abuse as the reason behind shutting down trials. That the pause is because of massive amounts of people making throwaway accounts to get free images. But that's Midjourney's version. Most believed that it was the storm over the Trump and Pope images that really led landed the artificial intelligence app in some very real soup. Along with Trump, Midjourney generated images of President Emmanuel Macron walking through the ongoing protests in Paris and Elon Musk holding hands with US lawmaker Alexandria Cortez have also stoked internet fires around the abuse of AI by mischief makers. Midjourney's response so far has been inadequate and lacking a comprehensive strategy to address this issue of realistic images. The Midjourney storm puts the spotlight on similar services like OpenAI's DAL-E and Stable Diffusion, though experts believe Midjourney hasn't done enough yet to address the threat of fake images on its platform. The company has promised to ship improved features soon, but the spotlight has done enough already to ring one of the loudest alarm bells in this early wave of AI. Bureau Report, India Today. So is artificial intelligence a boon or a bane? I spoke to Microsoft's global president, Brad Smith, at the India Today conclave on what to expect from the next generation of AI. Here's an excerpt from that conversation before we start our larger debate tonight. 
So it's being said we're moving into the age of artificial intelligence and to talk about the potential and the pitfalls of generative AI aspects which should be celebrated aspects which we should all be worried sick about, we're joined virtually at the India Today Conclave by Brad Smith, Vice Chair and President of Microsoft. Mr. Smith, we met at the World Economic Forum at Davos in January and between then and now, Microsoft, you and ChatGPT have virtually upturned the technological world as we knew it. I want to start by asking you about three statements which define different aspects of artificial intelligence. We had Sundar Pichai declaring that AI will be more profound than fire. We had the ex uh, chief business officer for Google X saying we are creating God. And then Elon Musk said we're summoning the demon. According to you, which one is it? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is uh, those three quotes are all good illustrations of the fact uh, that the tech sector is never short on hype or hyperbole. Uh, I do think that uh, the one that I would select as the closest to me is Sundar's. Um, I don't know that I would match it with fire, but I think we will find that generative AI you know, is on a par with, say, the, you know, the Internet. Uh, you know, it's on a par perhaps with the combustion engine or maybe even the steam engine and all of the things that ushered in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in some ways, it will be profound in the sense that it, in many ways, is bringing the Industrial Revolution to knowledge work. And I think it has the opportunity to just improve critical thinking, to improve creative expression, uh, to massively improve productivity, uh, to connect people in new ways. So I'm very enthusiastic about it. And at the same time, as I'm sure we'll get into, there are undoubtedly people around the world who will find ways to use it for less noble aspirations as well. And we'll have to manage our way through all of this. In the response that you've received to ChatGPT, has this been as per your expectations, way beyond your expectations? And what's the kind of response you've picked up to ChatGPT4, which has just come out recently? You know, in many ways, I think it uh, has been similar to, to the level of enthusiasm or just interest but there have been many differences that none of us, I think, really expected, say, last October or November, or, or let me say last August when I was in India and you know, we knew what was coming, but it wasn't yet public. Um, you know, to me, one of the better illustrations of the surprises uh, was the first controversy that really emerged. Uh, for those of you who just think back, uh, ChatGPT was released on the 30th of November last year. And within 30 days, the first controversy was really in many countries from teachers who were concerned about whether students would use it to cheat. Um, and that's not something that we had spent a lot of time thinking about at Microsoft. I don't think the folks at OpenAI had. We had thought about you know, where there might be controversies and it was not on the top of our list. It's, I think, caused us all to reflect on two things. One is just the way that this will, on an ongoing basis, uh, you know, interact or intersect with public opinion, you know, with different currents of thought, um, you know, different unexpected challenges that we'll have to think through quickly. And at the same time, it's a powerful reminder to me at least of how every new technology like this unsettles people in some ways at first, and then we all eventually just incorporate it into our lives for good or bad. 3,000 plus people, including senior tech executives, Top artificial intelligence researchers asking for a pause on the advancement of artificial intelligence beyond the capabilities of ChatGPT4. They are worried that if uh, we keep making new advancements, we'll soon reach a situation where we'll not be able to keep things under control and that machine learning could race way ahead of what we've been able to set up guardrails for. And remember, 
those who are asking for a pause on the advancement of AI include the likes of Elon Musk, AI pioneer Joshua Bengio, uh, the likes of Yuval Noah Harari, well-known uh, historian Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, and several top professors. So, what makes the most amount of sense? Given what we've seen over the past several months, is it at all feasible to halt AI where we've reached? And why should this be thought about? And I just want to quote some parts from this letter. Pause giant artificial intelligence experiments an open letter, which is essentially a call on AI labs to pause for six months the training of AI systems more powerful than ChatGPT4. It says, in recent months, we've seen AI labs locked in an out-of-control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict or reliably control. Powerful AI systems should be developed only once we are confident that their effects will be positive and their risks manageable. This confidence must be justified and increase with the magnitude of a system's potential effects. Joining us on this broadcast, I want to welcome Urvashi Aneja, Director at the Digital Futures Lab. With us also is Prashant Warrior, CEO at Query.ai. Pranesh Prakash is a founder at the Anekanta Advisory Services. Rahul Day is a professor of Information Systems uh, with the Indian Institute of Management in Bengaluru. Shriram Birudabulu is the CEO of Cybersecurity Center for Excellence. And with me are two of my colleagues, Ayush Ailavadi is Business Today's Tech Editor and Nilanjan Das heads our creative division at the India Today Group and he's been experimenting a lot with AI and he can take us through some of what he's seen and his concerns and even how it's radically changing the work that our creative department does. So let me go across first to Urvashi Aneja on the issue of this open letter signed by 3,000, several of whom are very well-known signatories, asking for an immediate pause that the growth of AI has been much faster than what society has been able to wrap its head around so far and that this should be paused till enough guardrails can be set up. Do you agree with that view, Urvashi? Hi, thanks for having me on the show. And it's great to know that issues around the ethics and governance of AI have now made it to mainstream uh, media and public imagination. Um, on, the, on the moratorium and the letter, um, on one hand, I don't think it's feasible uh, to have this kind of moratorium. There's a lot of investments, there's a lot of vested interests already in this space. But I also think a moratorium doesn't make sense unless we actually have an action plan on what we're going to do during that moratorium. Otherwise, we're back in the same situation six months from now. So I think instead of a moratorium, we need to be asking what are the concrete measures and what are the concrete things that we can do to ensure that the development and deployment of these systems is done in a safe and ethical and responsible manner. Um, so rather than things like a moratorium, what we need is greater transparency around the data that is being used by these systems, how that data has been collected, how that data has been curated, how these models work, how these models have been trained. Um, we also need, I think, impact assessments before these models are, are rolled out at large and before they're commercialized. Um, we also need disclosure around when they're being used. Um, so I think of them a little bit kind of as food systems, right? So when you have uh, food systems come with warning labels, they come with disclosures, they go through a rigorous period of testing or evaluation to see whether they actually fit to be rolled out commercially and to be introduced to the public at large. Um, so that kind of certification system, those kinds of dis disclosure, that kind of transparency and accountability is really what we need. Okay. Um, not a moratorium in itself. But the interesting thing is that who evaluates, who assesses? There are no bodies which exist to regulate uh, the growth of artificial intelligence. So all the assessment that you're asking for on the ethical side, the safety side, there is no mechanism at this moment. Governments and regulators don't really understand what's going on. Oftentimes, in the manner in which these systems are created, even their creators don't have the full sense of what the capabilities of their machines are. Uh, let's go across to Pranesh uh, Prakash and get his sense on whether this uh, moratorium that's been asked for and has sparked such a big debate internationally is at all feasible. Urvashi's point is you definitely need to review 
the systems that are in place, there are no systems right now for checks and balances. Does a moratorium make sense in your view, Pranish? I partially agree with Urvashi, uh, but and I also don't think that a moratorium makes any sense. We've been having discussions around AI and ethics. I've personally been involved in these discussions for the last seven years, and it's not as though we have any global standards. Uh, there are things such as the OECD standards, but I don't think they're uh, easily implementable at a global level. Given that, I don't see how a six-month moratorium actually helps. Uh, just to drill down a bit deeper, there are uh, three sets of concerns that uh, they raise in this letter. One is about uh, jobs and whether AI will take away jobs. I think it's hard to uh, uh, soon to tell who could have predicted when the internet was invented in the 19, uh, late 60s that uh, we'd have you know people with jobs uh, streamers that that others would would literally watch people wa playing video games over uh, the internet and people could make a living out of this you couldn't have predicted this so uh, i think it's it's far too soon to tell what the effect on jobs are going to be uh, another concern is disinformation I think that concern is misplaced. The real problem with, with this information is information coming through uh, through trusted sources, and the number of sources that are trusted are are not very many. So uh, it's it's a supply problem when it comes to disinformation, not really a, a creation problem. And uh, I don't think uh, disinformation is a real concern. The third is uh, an existential concern about uh, humanity itself, whether we can survive if machines get smarter than us. Now, machines already in various ways are smarter than us. What they're really pointing to is uh, whether we survive if machines gain a, a consciousness that's independent of humans. And I think we're far away, uh, away from uh, artificial general intelligence, as it's called and uh, what we see in form of uh, large language models, things like chat, GPT, et cetera, which uh, sometimes react in very human-like ways because they use human language, uh, is just that. They're just uh, instances of human language being used and us anthropomorphizing that technology and, and treating it as though it's uh, partially human-like. And, and what we need to prevent that education, okay. not a six-month moratorium. Uh, Nilanjan, do you want to just give our viewers a sense of how uh, the availability of these artificial intelligence tools is impacting the work that you do? And I just want to tell our viewers that Nilanjan heads our creative department at the India Day Group. So at the India Day Conclave recently, a lot of the covers that were playing at the back on the screen were actually generated through artificial intelligence. Yeah. So you've been doing a lot of experiments. Tell us how it's impacted your work and what you think of this global debate. So in my opinion, uh, uh, Rahul, the best part is it is a tool. It's, it's, it's created by us. It is controlled by us. It's a tool. As long as in my case where the design is a very important part of the process, I think uh, AI has given me a power as a tool. And I using, I'm using it as a tool. But also if you check the letter, I'll come back to the letter part where Elon Musk has sent a letter. He, he just created his own avatar of, uh, of AI and he's just posted across. So how could you take this guy seriously? And also there are a lot of controversy around the mail as well, where four of those experts are saying why we are included in that name. There are name added like Xi Jinping in that letter. And these are the, these, the letter has lot of, lots of loopholes. But in uh, coming to the design part of it, I think uh, it's a new tool. Uh, we are overreacting. When computer came, as he said, computer came and everybody was scared. I remember people was agitating and saying we are all it is the end of the world and stuff like that. We st we are still here. We are very adaptable uh, creature. We we create things, we adapt it, and we and we use it. Yeah, but the risk in some of the tools that have been created, take Mid Journey as an example, is that you can simulate all kinds of scenarios. Uh, you could have, uh, you know. Joe Biden with Xi Jinping, you could have Xi Jinping with the Chinese president or Modi and Xi Jinping together. And at this moment, the fact checking tools aren't sophisticated enough to be able to catch them out. And with deep fakes and some of these tools that are available, the possibility of there being massive misinformation is huge. Ayush, 
give our viewers a sense of how the tech world is divided over the issue of whether the march of artificial intelligence continues unabashed or is there time to pause and take stock? It's interesting, Rahul, that you mentioned the tech world is divided and you also spoke about Elon Musk a short while ago. You have to give Elon Musk some credit where it's due, no matter all the mudslinging and, and the sort of things that are said in the media and social media, because he does a bunch of, of eccentric things. But even back in 2017 and 2018, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg were involved in a public spat over the future of AI. And Elon Musk, even back then, he had invested in OpenAI, but now he claims that he's sold all stake in the company, which is now backed by Microsoft. And even then, he said that this will be perhaps the biggest, it would generally be the end of human civilization. He, he obviously dramatized a lot, but then Mark Zuckerberg said that this might just be the panacea to some of our problems. So he's had this uh, approach to it throughout. In terms of what's happened in Italy and, and this talk of other countries banning it, look, there are problems in tech and then there are solutions. The biggest problem uh, happens to be that the Italian Data Protection Authority so was investigating and banning Jack GDP because they said there were privacy concerns, right? Um, and also the fact that there's no way or no system to verify the age of minor users. It's a nascent technology competitor uh, from, from Google called Bard now only went to market recently when users could verify that they were over the age of 18. So that's one problem mischief managed on that front. In terms of the second bit, uh, the, the privacy and data concerns, yes, these are guardrails that need to be put in place. But in the EU itself, who are very, very particular about these legislations, the Artificial Intelligence Act is being legislated on right now. So there are uh, several mischiefs and a lot of them are getting managed. But yes, it is going to be work in progress in terms of how the tech community, regulators, policymakers all sit down on this together. And perhaps The problem in legislation in the Indian context, Professor Rahul Day, is that it's taken so long for us to be able to put together the contours of the draft privacy law, which still hasn't been passed and Parliament is hugely acrimonious at this moment. And therefore, if we start work now, on legislating and having a legal framework around artificial intelligence that could take a lot of time and by then well, you know, I was speaking to the Microsoft President Brad Smith at the conclave, he was talking about chat GPT-5 and then what comes beyond. By the time we get our law in order, the whole scenario could have changed potentially. Yes, yes, you're right. This, uh, this whole technology, AI is, is now seven decades old. And it is now at a point, an inflection point, where it is growing at an incredible speed. So yes, legislation is very difficult. Let me make one point, and I'm adding to my colleagues on this call. We don't understand ChatGPT. This is a class of technologies which are called generative AI. So they are producing text or images or even videos and they are producing them in a certain manner which we don't fully understand. At the core of some of these technologies are things like autoencoders. And this is a bunch of numbers being manipulated and moved around. We don't know what they are doing. And many people are now, many scientists are now saying we have to study this phenomena like it is some kind of alien life form and we have to understand its properties. To legislate, you have to first understand. And that understanding, by the time you finish with GPT-4, of course, five, six, seven will show up. No, but where so do you come out on the issue of this letter, uh, pause giant AI experiments, these 3,000 people, including some well-known people, coming out and saying, it's moving too fast, it's way too scary, we don't fully understand what's going on, just stop it. Stop it so that you can take stock of what has already been put out into society. You cannot stop it. It is backed by some of the largest companies in the world and it is backed by governments. They are the two parties which are very interested. One for competitive reasons. If one company, Microsoft, doesn't come up with it faster, Google will or Facebook will. So they have competitive reasons. And governments are very interested in this. Remember, these are the only two entities which have the resources, massive amounts of data and money to put into this problem. Are they going to stop working on this? I don't think so. You can write letters. 
See, there is a point to be made about weapons. And in the past, people have talked about biological weapons, nuclear weapons, and there have been letters written and there have been resolutions passed uh, across the world and people have agreed to it that they will have non-proliferation treaties and then we, they will have non-proliferation of biological weapons, etc. That is weapons. This is still not gone to the weapon stage as yet. No, but it can be weaponized. The fact that you can now, in the hands of bad actors, uh, have a scenario, Prashant Warrior, where they will be able to, whether it's hack into other people's systems or you know, build code that can be used in disruptive ways, their ability to cause trouble goes up much faster and much more than earlier. And therefore, raising concerns about what's the best way to ensure that bad actors are held at bay. Prashant. A question. Uh, so, as somebody who's been work, who's been working in this space for the last 23 years, I think see several things we need to understand. One is that uh, the technology uh, technology has been around. Right? It's not like the technology is very new. Right? And uh, what it is doing is it's now looking at a lot of data, a lot more data than it was looking at before. Right? Again, it's a narrow form of intelligence when we talk about artificial general intelligence. None of the technologies that are out there are close to general intelligence. I mean, everything is doing a very narrow task. They're doing narrow tasks really well. For example, at Cure.ai, we build AI algorithms which can automatically interpret radiology images. Now, that takes about 30 years of training for a human being, but the algorithm is, algorithm is now able to do that within a minute. And so that's what um, we do. And th there are various technologies like this which use AI for good, for better causes, right? In healthcare, education, there are so many different AI applications. So again, I think we have to be very careful about how we define this, right? ChatGPT is just one technology or one, one, one thing that is coming, but the applications of AI are vast from Google Maps to uh, spam filters to interpreting radiology images and so on. And, and I think the key issue that I see around this is that there is a lot of data that is being generated and AI is a black box. So when you're looking at uh, anything that is coming out of ChatGPT, there is, you, don't, you cannot guarantee that it's going to be 100% true. Right? It's also hallucinating a lot of facts. This also happens with even imaging AI. For example, there are imaging image generators online now, right? You can generate images. Now, they are basically condensing data from a lot of internet sources, and that includes Getty images, for example. So, you are basically taking data that is paid for, I mean, that is basically not free data, and then you are training algorithms on that. Now, do you have the right to do that is the question, right? So, again, I feel like, I mean, I'm coming from the healthcare field where we are building AI for uh, radiology imaging. All of our products, are regulated, we have to go through an FDA clearance or a C marking. So that ensures that the product that goes out into the market is safe and it, it is effective and it's improving patient care. No, so sure. Is, so what you are doing is hugely commendable and it makes the work of uh, radiologists much easier and ensures that this can happen at scale at much cheaper prices. But Shriram, there is a concern that in the hands of bad actors, the disruptive prospects of artificial intelligence and some of these tools are much more than what bad actors had access to so far and therefore is it time as uh, these 3000 odd people are suggesting to just pause the development of AI to get a full sense of what's been unleashed so far or do you two think that that is impractical? Okay, uh, thanks Raul Kanur, very interesting uh, discussion and I do heartily concur with many of the points made by my esteemed panelists. So, Rahul, essentially, when you talk about pause, what really are we pausing? Are we pausing the research? Are we pausing the training? Are we pausing the rollout of the uh, I mean, software? And then again, different ones are at different stages. So it would be or give unfair advantage to some, and then uh, there are legalities to be considered. And what is the mechanism to be uh, to implement this pause anyway? For example the regulations, as you rightly pointed out, that privacy law itself takes uh, so much time uh, and you cannot build regulations in a hurry. So actually, this has created a nightmare for the cybersecurity world. Currently, there are about 560,000 new malwares being produced every day, and a lot of them are through AI. When you put a pause, you will put a pause on the good guys and not on the bad guys. That is one thing. There are now more than 1 billion malware programs out there. And of course, every minute, four companies fall victim to malware attacks and, and so on. 
So there are various ways in which things can be misused. So this, this would be a perfect time to allow things to progress, but monitor it extremely very closely and set uh, standards, regulations, uh, pretty much, and certifications. No, no, let's, let's take it one at a time. You're saying yeah. set standards and regulations. Who does this? We just discussed how uh, there is no global exactly. agency for one. And secondly, even if the government starts the process of drafting a law, by the time they come out, God alone knows where chat GPT and everything else is at that time. And therefore, a lot of their text could be redundant. So who legislates, who regulates, and who monitors? Yes. So good question. So there is an urgent need to invest money into these areas. Explainable AI. How did it arrive at a certain decision? Ethical and responsible AI, AI for good. So, for example, let's say deep fakes are a very big problem. Then the source and origin of those that are being released, anything that is being released publicly or on, a, on, a, on official platforms, the source needs to be established. So one must incentivize this. The governments must invest money into these standards bodies and frameworks, and the existing standards must be beefed up to include AI. For example, if there is robotics, you need to have AI included there, cybersecurity, AI included there or image processing. So blockchain-based solutions and other solutions may be of help that would even boost the startup ecosystem. No, but if the, the government starts to invest, by the time you know they actually roll out that investment, uh, Pranesh, it could take a lot of time. What can be done practically in the real world? Because the only people who understand to the extent possible the capabilities of their system are the AI developers themselves. The government, for the most part, you know, might frankly have very little clue. And therefore, What's the best way of building guardrails in the real world at this moment? There will be a period so of two kinds of ways. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Me. Yeah, I, I see there are two ways of addressing this. One is uh, to push for more free and open source software uh, and releasing uh, a lot more of AI technology as open source software to democratize the use of AI. And already there are some companies which are doing this, and I find that commendable. Uh, the big problem that I see going forward is uh, the difference in, in AI capability between different countries, between people who are poor and who are rich, and, and democratizing that uh, through free software, I think is, is a very important step forward. The second thing is uh, when it comes to regulation, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, regulating AI directly is a, a sensible approach. What we normally do in, in most cases when it comes to, say, new technologies is regulating the harmful impacts, the harmful effects. So uh, regulating specific kinds of uses of AI in various fields, uh, I think will have more success uh, as an approach. And when it comes to AI itself as a, a kind of technology, looking for more transparency uh, is the best that regulation really can do uh, at the technology level. But you can't uh, put in place uh, firm guardrails uh, to prevent uh, you know, bad uses of it. The, the best you can do is actually prosecute people who are putting AI to bad uses, just as you would people who are using any technology for bad, uh, such as nuclear technology uh, or computer technology or electricity. It, it, it's a technology like that, and we go after people who misuse it in various ways. Uh, I don't think this is comparable, for instance, to, uh, uh, say, biological technologies like human cloning, which at the technology level itself, we uh, put in prohibitions. Okay, uh, those are good suggestions. The fact that you must press these AI researchers to be more transparent in what they're doing and explain. Uh, the mechanics involved in generating certain responses. Nilanjan, to give viewers a sense, do you want to just take us through some of the work that you've done? We'll have the camera zoom in so you can show uh, and also compare what you're showing now with how you would have done this right. in the past. So just explain that and keep the screen towards the camera. Yeah, so, go on. See, uh, uh, the regulation part, this is, what I'm, this is the, what I'm doing now with playing around. You just made this on uh, yeah. Dali. No, in mid journey mid and journey. Uh, stable diffusion. So th these images uh, earlier we used to do a lot of thing in softwares. So it, nothing has changed for us. We used to do a software. We used to take one hour or one and a half hour to create one. Now I'm doing it with a prompt within ten seconds. That's the time is the. So what took one and a half hours now takes ten seconds. Yes, 
that's the difference uh, otherwise i don't think for the regulation part i will say okay, see now the the whole world ai world is governed by top corporates there are few of them who is running the show if the regulation could happen now that should be done on the corporation no but the thing is that let's assume that this uh, image that you've generated right. has been generated in 10 seconds you are known as one of the best creative directors in the country, right? Now, you, you have a special set of talent. Now, you've got this big machine which is throwing out these images and someone much junior to you in your team could potentially do the same thing and possibly someone outside your team could do it as well. The trick is the, the how you explain things here. The art is earlier when you used to do something, graphic design or anything, you have to, give, you have to ideate, you have to create that. Ideate has changed into prompt. My idea is now my prompt. So the way I put things inside the prompt... Well, people don't need your level of training to be able to do some of this. Yes, but there are loopholes also. In, in, in that sense, when you're creating something, the whole idea... For instance, there's Rishi Shunak doing a Bollywood dance. That's an idea. I could have do it in a paper, I could have oil painted it, I could put an AI or I could have put it in a uh, Photoshop uh, software. But I'm doing it through AI. Exactly what I said earlier. It's a tool for us as well. So I think like Obama in a Bollywood thing. I will do it in Photoshop if AI was not available, but my idea remains the same. It's the platform for me. One is to understand AI cannot replace us. Somebody who knows AI will replace us. In my case, a designer who understands AI will play around with the visuals and recreate his own idea with it. So in my opinion, I'm not that threatened till now. I don't know what happens in future. A lot of things happening. Tech is going so fast. Everything is changing so fast. I don't know. But now I'm enjoying enjoying the ride. At this moment, you're enjoying the ride. Right. Urvishi Aneja, there's a report out by Golden, uh, Golden Sachs which says that 300 million plus people could potentially uh, lose their jobs on account of AI. And that level of joblessness, if it were to actually happen, is also something the human world isn't ready for. I mean, if there are 300 million people suddenly going jobless or going jobless over a short span of time, that will create pushback in society as well. Yeah, I think the I think the impact on jobs is real. It's a very serious policy uh, issue that requires much more consideration. Um, but like like my colleague was saying right before, I don't think it's as binary as having a job or not having a job. Many of these jobs will change. Many different types of skills will be re will be required, and the people who have those skills may not be the same people who are right now doing those jobs. So there will be some displacement. But I also want to just caution against these kind of narratives which spell. Uh, you know, mass joblessness and the kind of existential crisis to mankind. I think in some sense they distract from the already real harms that we see happening. So all the uh, all the all the all the data that AI images that AI systems are trained on has been labeled and annotated by human beings, and those human beings are typically in uh, less developed countries, working at a very low wage, in very exploitative working conditions, um, even on things like stable diffusion, Dali so on and so forth. There's a lot of content moderation work that takes place. And this is again done by individuals uh, who are repeatedly exposed to uh, horrific and disturbing images and text. So there's already really real harms that we see um, that are being uh, experienced by people. And we need to focus on those very real harms today and not get swept up with the kind of fear mongering uh, around AI. I also don't I think we have a, a responsibility to not buy into this narrative around kind of technological determinism or that there's a certain speed at which technology is unfolding and we have no control over that. Uh, the speed at which it's unfolding is a result of decisions, it's a result of policies, it's a result of regulation. And in the case of something like Chat GPT, the reason that it's able to, uh, that we see such mass kind of commercialization and so many products out is because the data on which these systems is built has been collected illegally and unethically. So the speed is only because we're not following due process. If we follow pro proper process... No, but who enforces that process? How do you ensure that process is actually followed? Well, that's, that's the role of states and that's where states have to come in. But, you know, by the time the states actually understand what's going on because there are elections they are worried about, there is uh, all kinds of problems that, you know, the, the state is dealing with at this moment and while they're looking in a very peripheral fashion at what uh, AI is up to, that concern is not really front and center for most people in government. 
it's the role of states but it's also the role of companies we do need some amount of self regulation we need more debates like this we need kind of public opinion to build up so that there is a pushback against these technology companies so that people vote with their feet about what kind of products they want to buy that they buy products that are safe that are privacy protecting uh, that don't cause harms that have been tested so there is a role for public education here as well okay uh, professor rahul day your your suggestions on the best ways of putting guard rails at this moment not some utopian suggestion which takes years to actually implement but something which can be done here and now yes it is awareness building we have to educate ourselves all of us how this technology grows and changes and how it is shaping our lives i'll take an example of social media actually many people use social social media practically all of us well we don't know how it is shaping us we should understand that and sh- social media is shaping our lives powerful technologies like ai you know th- they have an immediate impact but their impact serious impact is much more long term in this case our long term might get squeezed into a few years but these are foundational technologies which will take long so we have to understand that is the first thing so legislation having regulations rules will come after we understand if we don't understand it we are lost are you sure you want to tell us about how other countries are dealing with these same concerns from a legalistic uh, societal framework perspective absolutely rahul i'd love to don my lawyers at when you look at what's happening in in europe like i said earlier there is an ai law that they are working on but yes the concern there strangely also is that by the time that law is passed ai would have grown in leaps and bounds exponentially and then we'd be dealing with a different monster altogether when we come back to the india context as well uh, look there's been several attempts at a privacy legis- legislation but uh, every time the supreme court does talk about it it seems to be part of article 21 and it's read into that there's also a digital personal data protection bill when we're talking about some of the uh, you know some of the data and in terms of how it's recorded and stuff like that but more importantly i also think more than just the state coming up with incumbent on these big tech they're going to do their jobs they have a blinder approach and they have to get the job done big tech companies like microsoft and google are backing these projects a lot of them are pumping in billions of dollars and instead of fear mongering i think a great example in terms of guardrails being put up is something that apple did over the years and even they've been talking a lot about ai of late but something that apple did over the years which was that a lot of our data was being cross shared across apps and different platforms they've now come up with something and this is a little distant from ai but a great lesson to be learned called app tracking transparency where you as a user now the app and and the os gives you an option to decide where your data is is shared across with whom data brokers what kind of access they have it's ingenious solutions like this which involve of course some level of sanction from the state uh, and everyone complying with some of these laws and then big tech companies giving us these options and then the power being with us to use i think these are the sort of collaborative efforts and guard and guard rails we need to be put in place to ensure that things don't turn all right you know I'm glad we've had this discussion because this can't just be left to Reddit forum or to discussion among techies. This needs to be out in the public domain. People need to think very deep and hard about these changes because these are massively disruptive and transformative changes. And tech companies alone can't be allowed to decide what works for them because they're largely looking at it from their commercial perspectives. Uh, you've heard different uh, points of view. There is no. clarity on what's the best way forward but there must be more discussion more debate and we must find ways of ensuring that not just are we keeping track of the changes but also finding ways to regulate and also ensure that disruptive changes are not unleashed without any check so we'll keep tracking the story very carefully and very closely for the time being to all our guests for joining us on this broadcast thank you very much i hope you enjoyed uh, some of the insights as well and while there is a lot to celebrate there's a lot to be very very concerned about as well we'll slip into a break i'll have more for you when we come back on the other side stay with us back in a moment
could be a challenging year for financial uh, for investors of equities if in FI24 and especially keeping in mind that there is uh, always a macroeconomic uncertainty to look at as an overhang on the markets one will have to really be selective about the positions they take and select stocks as well another important factor that i wanted to understand uh, you know in FI23 we actually saw 2.5 lakh crore rupees of bonanza record DII buying that was a saving grace on D street in FI23 for investors meanwhile we actually saw foreign institutional investors becoming net sellers for the second consecutive uh, financial year they actually net sold uh, shares worth over 40400 crores this fiscal uh, what i want to understand is will FII's return this year can that be a supportive factor that one can bet on in FI24 yeah i think uh, sakshi for FII's to return i think it would be a little uh, early because i think as uh, all of us know that uh, you know the fed governor mr powell has said that after uh, the recent rate hike possibly another rate hike in uh, this uh, in, a, in this year is possible so i think as and when you know when there is a pause in interest rates in the us possibly that is a time when you could see some flows coming back to india i think uh, on a very broader basis i would believe that after november or december we could see flows coming back in 2024 but 2023 is going to be challenging i think we'll have to depend on domestic sip flows which continue to remain strong and i think fis would continue to pull out money so that definitely would remain a challenge so at least in the very near term uh, one can't expect fis to make a very strong comeback considering that interest rates have started moving up in the us a lot of money has got shifted to debt there so i think we'll have to wait for at least another you know maybe comfortably two or three quarters before we could see a strong flow coming in from the fis once again in the markets but longer term i think they can't ignore us 